Attention Austin guitarists, are you in need of setup or repair on your axe even in these quarantine times? Well, I have the guy for you. That's my friend Jason Swedberg over at J. Scott Luthery. Find him at jscottluthery on facebook.com. Gang, I've been taking my guitars to Jason for over 20 years, and not only does he do the best job, but he's got the best prices and the fastest service in town. Again, find him at J. Scott Luthery on Facebook. Whether it's acoustic, electric, or bass, Jason Swedberg is your guy. J. Scott Luthery on Facebook. Go get your guitars fixed. Let's get down. Did I get here? And now here is your host. I'm Molly. Well, we talk. All right, hello. I'm Johnny. I'm your host. Welcome to the show. Oh, gang, I hope you're safe, healthy, and sane wherever it is that you are. Because uh, it's a crazy time. It is a crazy time. I don't really even need to get into it. I'm doing this on uh, on Tuesday The day before this show comes out in the afternoon, right after I've had my afternoon espresso, which, by the way, is starting to become a thing. It gets to be about 4 o'clock, and I start getting a little weird, like, oh, I need a little, I need the thing, I need the thing. So I think I'm getting addicted to uh, between 4 and 5 p.m. espresso, which is, I mean, look, there's there's worse stuff I could be addicted to, I guess, right? I could be like an Adderall guy or like a cocaine guy or a speed guy. But I right now I'm in the Bustello, Cafe Bustello, espresso stage of my addiction. And it happens between 4 and 5 p.m. every day throughout this thing. That's the thing that, that, that kind of gets me going. So basically I'm worried that after this is over I'm going to have to go to some espresso anonymous meetings. Uh, maybe you guys know. Maybe, maybe there's some of you, some of you out there will be joining me. Anyway, yeah, it is a crazy time. I, I, this has been this has been kind of insane. I'm I'm holding on to my sanity. I had my days. I had kind of a meltdown yesterday. My dad, uh, this honest, my dad freaked out on me. Uh, he freaked out on me and called me a Democrat, and literally told me to go fuck myself and hung up the phone on me, because uh, because he told me he got a, a <laughs> he got a coronavirus test. To prove to everybody that his driving around all day and going places was fine. So I asked him when he took the test. He told me he took it last Wednesday. So I said, do you realize that that doesn't mean that you're, that you're, that you're clear of it now? And man, that was the wrong thing to say. He flipped out on me. And then, <laughs> then today, the Texas Medical Association had asked me over the weekend to, uh, to submit a, a, a video of me telling people to stay home. That they'd share it, you know, Austin musicians trying to get people to stay home, <laughs> and I sent it to him, no response. So we're on we're on opposite sides of the thing. I saw the president's. Uh, I, I watched the briefing for some reason yesterday. I thought I'd learn something, but all I learned is that that guy had somebody make a videotape of other people saying that he was great. Not a videotape, but a video montage of all these governors saying how great he is, and he showed it in the middle of the briefing. Um. I don't know. Look, I don't get. Look, I, I, I don't try to sit here and, and rant about politics or anything like that. But at some point, we have to realize how unbelievably weird it is for a guy to show a video montage, like during a, a, a fucking worldwide health crisis pandemic, this guy during his briefing to tell America how to take care of themselves and what to do and his panel of doctors chose to take i don't know how long that i don't know how long that montage was it was surreal to me it seemed like something that michael scott from the office would do and it was it was yeah so i got turned off and i realized that this is just a giant mess of weirdness and it's just going to get weirder as it goes on and i'm trying to brace myself and i'm trying to take myself uh put myself into the information loop enough to get the information that i need but take myself out before the insane shit starts going on (laughs) <laughs> I don't know how you do that. I'm trying to do it. I'm trying to do it. 2020 so far has been an incredibly weird year. Which brings me to today's guest. My dear old friend, the amazing songwriter, Eliza Gilkison, 
is on the show today, and she has a brand new album out that came out last Friday. It's called 2020. And yeah, I know. I know, I know. And when you listen to the record, I mean, the record's really beautiful, but it's, it's a record comprised of politically char- charged anthems designed to motivate. It actually has hope in it, but, but there is some, some serious reflection about what's going on in our times, which is what Eliza Gilkison is, is amazing at. I'm ama- she's an amazing songwriter, but she's also an amazing folk singer. Like telling the story of what's going on, how things should change, this kind of thing. And I'm very proud to have known her since I was a kid. She was a friend of my mom's and I met her when I was like 13 years old, maybe 12, 13. Just a beautiful, beautiful soul. I've, I've known her all that time. She means a lot to me. Her music means a lot to me. She's always been an inspiration and a beacon sort of, of what I can be. And um, for those of you that are listening that maybe come from a time that maybe you live in a world that Eliza Gilkison doesn't doesn't come through. You know, there's people, you know, and like if you're like a pop music fan, this is an amazing, amazing woman with an incredibly rich career of making records for for like fifty years. Fifty years of making records. Um, she's had her songs covered by Joan Baez, who wasn't a, a huge, huge fan of hers. And this is, I think, like her, I, I can't remember if it is her 25th album, but, but this is deep in their album. And the album was, was produced by her amazing son, Cisco. He also plays drums on it. And she has Mike Hardwick on the record, Kim Warner on the record, uh, Chris Marsh, Warren Hood, Bucca Allen, Jamie Harris and Betty Sue singing backup. I mean, it's just an amazing job. Amazing, amazing record, amazing songwriter. She's been uh, nominated for Grammys twice in her career over the last, like, I think, like 15 years or so she's gotten those nominations. But she is an amazing artist. She's a very honest person and a beautiful person. And it was great to reconnect to her and finally get her on the show because this has been years. We've been talking about it. And finally, I reached out to her a few months ago and she goes, you know what? In a couple months, let's do this. I've got a new record coming out. The record's called 2020. It's out now, produced by Cisco Ryder, her son, who is an amazing, amazing drummer and amazing producer. This is my dear friend, Eliza Gilkison. Enjoy our conversation. Let's get down. As I journey through my life in wonder struck by your beauty divine With your blue seas and skies A feast for my eyes And your fragrance of sagebrush and pine All right. So I went to the grocery store this morning. Oh, and my God. Yeah, I know. It was, it's, it, it, it's, it's like... We'll get into that in a second, but... Uh, I just walked around singing uh, the chorus from uh, the first song in your album, "We're on Fire." <laughs> I was just, I was just singing that as I was looking yeah. for onions because they were out of onions, and every yeah. time they were out of something, I just kept singing it. We're on fire. Yeah, yeah I know. Well, you, you know, I think I was in a pretty apocalyptic space when I wrote it. <laughs> yeah, definitely. I mean, what uh, that that <laughs> <laughs> your album is called Twenty Twenty. And it, uh, the album cover itself, I don't know if the artwork is available to everyone, but in my promo, I got to see the album art cover and it's, it's pretty intense. It's, it is so intense. Yeah. Yeah. It, it actually is a painting by a, a, a painter who has lived in Austin, uh, or yeah, he, he's from here. His name's Ryder Henry. Uh-huh. And the painting is like a good three foot by three foot painting that has, hangs in my son and my daughter-in-law's house. Oh, nice. And I've been looking at it for years and going, oh my God, the, I've been looking deep into that painting for years. And I, when I did this record, I thought, the, the thing about that painting is the more you look at it, the more little signs of hope are in there. Yeah. But you have to really study it because at first it looks like the end of the world. It looks like it's over. It looks like apocalypse, you know, like Mad Max or something. But then as you study the details, you see there's all these people have come out of their buildings and everything's jerry-rigged together. And there's people having a little picnic in the park and there's all these vehicles that are rusting out. And But somehow you see this little thread of humanness 
that prevails that com somehow rises up out of this out of this terrible ending and I thought it's apocalyptic but it has that beautiful little ray of hopefulness in it right well even there's always like that in the apocalyptic scriptures even people like uh like Nostradamus after he said it's gonna, there's going to be a huge war and then there'll be a thousand years of peace like there's always like this beautiful thing that happens yeah after the apocalypse which i hope I think is true <laughs> we we have to we have to hope for that and i think it's really written into our dna that we that we look for that redemption i i think it's we have a very old old dna memory of things re uh, cycling and cycling and cycling and so i think we do call on that and uh, and and i think it's it, i think it's valid if 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 the earth can recover from what we've done to her <laughs> then then there is there's great hope for starting over yeah um this album is amazing and you were talking about that it ha that the painting hangs in your son's house who i've known for a long time cuz full disclosure i'll probably talk about this in the uh in the intro i've known you since i was like 12 or 13 years old I, I, I think I think of you as family. Yeah, I really yeah. Do. Likewise, and I think of Cisco and Delia the same way. Oh, uh, they uh, like, loved yeah, you. They yeah. looked up to you. You were like this guy that was, you know, this kid that was becoming the thing that they were, you know, that they aspired to. Right, the teenager <laughs> when they were like nine or ten. Or, yeah, 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 exactly. yeah, yeah. Yeah, I had those yeah. kind of guys too. Well, you were like <laughs> that for me did. as well. You know what I mean. Oh, I know, I know, and I remember how important Mark Hallman was for you, too. Still Just, is, yeah. Yeah, it still is, yeah. of course. Yeah, he was that for a lot of young men. I, um, he, I think if all the young men came forward and said, who was the, when they, when they left home, when they did that important thing that men have to do, yeah. which is they, they have to leave the, the family unit, but they look for um, male role models, and I think he was that for a lot of young men. Oh yeah, and a great role model too. A great oh uh, the best. A he listener. took it seriously. Yeah, Very, he, he he took it to heart. Yeah. yeah. Um, what I was gonna say was I was uh, Cisco did a brilliant job with the record, and has you've been you you guys have been doing the last few records together. We have since Red Horse, um, which was hit the first time. I kind of said okay. That was I. We were only going to do um, four songs on that one, and that was my first production. Like, okay, just take it and let's see what we how we do together. And he he was fantastic on that. And I I had been touring with him for years and and playing with him you know since he was a teenager. But um, and I always loved his his take on music, his taste and his take, and and he had such an eclectic taste across the board. But he had such a feel for what was the thing that made uh, music magical, what was the little thread that made it communicate something special, and it didn't matter if it was lo-fi or 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 hi-fi. He had a feel for it, and so I f I felt like I could trust him. But over the years, he's now done. This is the third record of my complete record of mine that he's done and it's been a process of turning over more and more um control to him because i'm kind of a control freak you know so but this last one i really just said because i was touring i was out with richard thompson i i, I just hand he just had basic tracks like you got to do this so of course he did great <laughs> yeah brilliant job and everyone that played on it did a great job but what i was going to say was i was so taken by his feel on the drums he is a killer drummer and has just amazing feel. He sits at the back end of the beat and leaves you that little yeah. split second to phrase. And uh, all singer songwriters, we all love that a little extra second, split second to get to phrase, and it really makes a difference. It actually um, gives you a, a considerable amount of space um, to to uh, uh, think to be more free with your wording and so he does that and he's also he never was a you know heavy top drummer he was much more about um where's the feel on this thing so yeah i'm so glad to hear you say that because uh you know, he, he's he's not a flashy drummer he's a pocket drummer yeah oh he is yeah and that's way yeah. better than a flashy drummer well it's for people like me yeah. who are like it's all about me me too <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> So, man, yeah, this is, it's like 50 years you have been making records. Yeah. But even before uh, yeah. that, you were doing recording, like, with your dad and stuff? Yeah, so it's more like 50, 55, 57 years, I guess, I've been doing this since I was, you know, uh, 12 years old, 13 yeah. years old. 
Yeah. When I was going through your discography, uh, I couldn't, I don't know if I couldn't find it to listen to, but I saw it in there and I remembered I had a cassette of it and it was a Lisa Gilkison, No Commercial Potential. <laughs> so funny to you. Those are worth tens of dollars now. Really? Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, um, yes, uh, that was the first, that was my first release. It was a cassette release. Yeah. What, what, we printed up like 200 of them. Did, and, yeah. Were you living here then? No, I was, in, I was living in New Mexico in a house that had no running water or electricity. So everything we did was either, you know, off of batteries or, you know, gravity feed from from big water containers and outhouse. And uh, but but that was how we did it. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. It, it was a true cassette. It was true lo-fi. Right. <laughs> well, there was something about that that I for some reason I've never forgotten it. I remember liking it a lot. And I remember also... Uh, is there a story behind the name of that album? No commercial potential. Yeah. Did the someone story tell you is, that? <laughs> no. Th yes. That. That exactly. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. I've been told that for now, you know, fifty-five years. I. I mean, I am, um, and I believe it. <laughs> I just when so, you know you have so many people telling you that you know it's like okay and and I'm going to keep doing this you know that yeah yeah. My, yeah. That's and I think a lot of people go through that. A lot of artists go through through incredible rejection, and it is very painful. I've been I've been um, rejected chronically for you know much of my life, my right. adult life, and and I've had to learn to uh, grieve and go through all my emotions, and then just go. Well, I'm just going to do this. You know, I. I've never really compromised what I've done. Well, the few times that I have tried to compromise to go pursue that thing, yeah. I sucked. I just sucked at it. So I'm, I'm better off doing the thing that I do and just go, okay, I think there's some people out there who, who I'm just building a grassroots thing and I have a life outside the industry and it's actually a beautiful life. Right. I feel like, like uh, for me... And you probably feel this way too. That album Pilgrims that you guys made, uh, which was like it was like like eighty six or something or eighty seven. Yeah, yeah, eighty six. I think. I think you're right. Was that what you feel like was your was your first real step into this journey that you're on, like this trajectory? Uh, yes. Only it was a kind of an unfortunate first step because I had come up through the folk scene and I was such a folky and and then when um when we were but when when I got the record deal to with a very small label in Los Angeles that was a new age label I suddenly became I went on to the the world stage as a new age artist and that was really a real drag for me because I, I never was that, but but that record was decidedly, it was very much about this whole Jungian um, concept that I had about m the masculine, feminine uh, archetypes and how we live at, play these um, archetypical um, games over and over again without really realizing it in relationships. And so it was this kind of, it, I, it, it got taken up by the New Age community and um, and I never was that, but suddenly I was like the queen of new age vocal, and that's when I and that all these people thought that's what I was, and I got so much, you know, all the cool people hated me, and and so I was, so I've just never been cool. I've always been on the wrong side. Is of it cool. like, was it who? What was new? What was new agey? Yeah, I mean, to me, because didn't the same thing like. I feel like Holman got you guys all in that boat. Like with Ian Matthews, his was like that. Was it those synthesizers? Is that what made it? We, we all did synthesizers. The and dreamy actual, synthesizers and acoustic guitar. And everything was through like this shitload of shit ton of reverb. And Mark and I, we listen now to those things just to laugh. And we, it sounds like all we took was the reverb send and used that. <laughs> vocals. It's like there's so much reverb on there. Yeah, and then the synthesizers, that was a big thing. And and then I I got, you know, I, I got swept into the into that sound and that vibe and, and then it was like, you know, waking up like 
is salt, you know, waking up in the forest and realizing, you know, that she'd been asleep for, ten, you know, 10 years and, and needed to go back to the real world. And it was like, you can't go back. You're a right. new age artist. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I do and have I had to. My, go sorry, go ahead. Were you going to say? No, I was just going to say that I had to pull my acoustic guitar back out of the closet like 10 years later and just go, and it was a cover with dust. You know, I was like, oh my God, I, I, there, there's my, there's my folky self. Yeah. <laughs> I uh that that album has a very special place to me because that album is one that you did after my mom died and for some reason I guess the people that were friends with her you and Holman everyone that was kind of involved with it at the time was people that had some kind of connection to that and for me listening to that record when it came out uh, honestly it was extremely healing it was like being with you mm-hmm. guys when I missed you you know. Oh, that is so sweet to yeah. hear because I can also see how it would be sad to listen to it now because it would take you back to that time, you know, and how you how you were feeling then. You you were so brave and and you, you know you 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 really did reach out to those people that you trusted, and it was it was the right thing to do because you know you could have gone south, you know, and it. it but instead, you just yeah. you just kept you 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 transformed it. You just kept growing yourself, and uh, and you put yourself around people who urged you to do that, made it safe for yeah. you to do that. You so, know, I, I, one of the thank you. I I uh, I I feel like my mom really put me in that with those people. She did. She did. Like That's I feel absolutely like, right. there's a lot of times when people will be like, so you know, how did you get? And I'm like, you know, my mom kind of planted me here. And she when did. she left, she left me with her friends who were the coolest people that I knew at the time, cooler than my friends. In the best of hands. Yeah, in best, the best of, hands. of hands. Best of hands. Yeah. So yeah. Um, let's go back. You were born in Los Angeles. Your dad was this crazy songwriter. Did you grow up in show business? He wasn't really. Um, he, he, I, I've told the story that, that my dad would get up every morning and put on a suit and tie and take his briefcase and drive into Hollywood and go to his office and write songs. And at the end of the day, he would drive home in the, in the L.A. traffic and, and and come home. And because and, and years later, I tried because he had a home office. He could, he could have easily written from there. But I we all thought later he was really just trying to sort of appease our mother into thinking he was normal, you know, it was like, <laughs> you know, here I go, like every other father in the hood, you know, I'm going to go to work in my yeah. car and not come home at five, like all the other fathers, but meanwhile, he was, you know, he was partying at lunchtime, they all went out to all the musicians and people in the industry, it was, they, they were all in, at Hollywood and, and Vine, there was this whole little um, Argyle Street um, group of, of the industry was about two blocks uh, square wow. in those days. And so they all knew each other. Right. So, and they were all the writers and artists and all the players, all the industry was right there. So they all partied their asses off. They, he'd come home after, you know, they they go to lunch at this famous restaurant there. And, and by the time he came home, he was already kind of had a hangover. So... Um, but he was writing there too. I mean, he's writing, writing his hits. So yeah. Uh, yeah, it was a, a, an interesting time. It was, it was romantic for us, but it also had a very. I think it was his idea to have a routine and a sense of normal normalcy. I think that was important to him. He he didn't he didn't strive to be a um, you know a radical folky who was um, you, you know a, right. had abandoned his family. He he was. He was he made a lot of choices uh, against his career to stay at home and be with his family. Um, wow. Uh, so he he brought you in to sing on sessions, and that's kind of like how did you get exposed? Did he play around the house? Did he? Um, y- you know, I uh, I I think what happened was well. I mean, we were instilled with the vibe. I remember at at age five seeing him perform for a group of guests um, at, at this place we were having a vacation. He pulled out his guitar and played one night. And I remember seeing him play. He was sitting on a, on a bench and I, and all these people were sitting there with a, you know, in the dark room with a fire and we were up in the mountains and everybody was just, you could hear a pin drop. He was playing his songs. And at a certain point I, I crawled over 
over next to him, right? And, and I just sat up and I looked out at all the people watching him and I felt this thing. And I, even at that time, I would, I would oh, this is the zone. I, I had a conscious, it's one of my first memories, actually. I felt it. I felt the exchange. I felt the, the high place that it was. And, I, and it, it definitely, you know, got the ball rolling for me. So it was early on. And then, and then I did get a voice. I think I was around 12. I was just playing around with a little auto harp. I started on an auto harp. And uh, I was just playing around with it. Suddenly this voice just started to sing out. And it was like, wh and I called him into the, in the room. I said, listen, <laughs> was like, this thing is happening. And, uh, and, he, and he, he wasn't very like, wow. He was sort of like, okay, you know, yeah. <laughs> I don't know. But, um, but I felt it. And, and uh, so then, but after a, a year or so of that, it, then he started using me on his demos because it was sort of a mature voice. Right. And did you start writing songs or playing out at all? When did you start? I think at a 15 or 16, I started writing songs, and they were always really angst-ridden, yeah. you know, teenage, <laughs> like, uh, um, but, but I was apocalyptic even then. I, I mean, I, I think I've always had the sense that um, nothing was forever yeah. and that something big was coming down the pike. I, 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 I was sort of premature in that, but I think I never felt... Um, I never felt blissfully ignorant of, of what was going on in, in the world. It came out in my music very early that, you know, that, that we were on the edge, you know, that and maybe it was just a sense of mortality. Uh, I don't know, just realizing that, that, that we are mortal. I think I realized that pretty early on. So it was always kind of in, in my music, but mostly it was just angst driven, you know. Yeah. <laughs> Teen, teenage stuff. I wish we could hear those right now. Um, <laughs> I, uh, in talking, like, was it, was it difficult to sort of like, cause it was like uh, 1965 or something and you're, you're, you're writing songs and playing them. And in the world of, of men and women of that time, I, I've just been reading Kathy Valentine's book and she's like, uh, she had the thing that she came up to, uh, girls don't play electric guitar and be the yeah. guitar player in a band like that's go do a normal thing you know what i mean there so, were no no female side guys except for the, the few exceptions that carol kane and stuff that we know about but there right. were very few very few yeah but there was that, that there was at that time you know there was joan baez was out was she around then yeah she was around then oh yeah she was huge influence uh, i'm probably my first influence outside of my dad because she was political and uh, I got that right off the bat so and she had a sim she did I didn't sing like her because she had that she had a soprano voice right right and but uh, she had a lot of vibrato which I had too and I've spent years trying to make it go away <laughs> <laughs> but um, yeah I had to work hard to lose that sucker and I still have it but um, it's if you listen to my early stuff it's like a fucking chainsaw <laughs> but, <laughs> but um, she was a big influence on me for sure. Well, what an amazing but, thing to come full circle to have her cover one of your songs. Three of my songs. Three of now. your songs. Shit. Yeah, yeah, I know. It 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 is almost surreal to have your idol from your childhood uh, um, pick your songs. Hell yeah. You know, to, yeah, it's it was a great compliment. A great, a wonderful feeling. Do you know her now? Like no, no I, I mean we we know who each other is, and she's we've met a few times, but um, we're not friends. Uh, you know, no. I mean, I think we would probably would be acquaintances if we lived anywhere near each other, right. but we don't. Yeah. Right. Okay. So, uh, so when did you start playing publicly? Um. Uh, well, my sister and I had a little uh, folk duo um, when I was thirteen and she was fifteen or fourteen and sixteen, probably. So that's when we first started playing for people. But um, I don't think I, I. My first public performance was uh, in you know high school, age fifteen, probably the talent show kind of thing. I I did some very angst driven. Um, so I played a 12, my first guitar that I bought was a 12 string. So I went from the auto harp to the 12 string and, uh, so my, as my first real guitar, I mean, I had a little funky Mexican guitar that Van Dyke Parks and his brother Carson helped me buy in Mexico. We all went down to Mexico and bought guitar and bought, bought guitars right off the, 
off the walls in this in, in Tijuana. Wow. And uh, yeah, drove across the border. They had to lie about our. I mean, those days the border was so lax. Coming back, oh yeah, these are our friends' kids, or you know, our. They, it wasn't any big deal. You didn't have to have ID or anything, but. Um, so, but we went down there and and, and uh, picked out our first guitars, and then uh, then I came back and my dad bought me my first really, well, he bought me my first two two guitars. They were, but I I don't have the twelve string anymore, but I still have the uh, the old uh, nylon string. Oh, really? Do you ever use it on stuff recordings? I, I've used it on yeah. yeah on my records, and and actually it was a funny story about that one because it came back to me. I had I gave it to Tony when I stopped playing um, nylon, and I gave it to my brother, and he had it for a while, and then he sold it for like twenty bucks to some guy in Santa Fe, and then about twenty years later, I was touring with Andreas Volenweider, and I, we were in a big um, performing arts center in uh, in Tampa or Saint, yeah, I think it was Tampa, and um, or what's the um, yeah. So anyway, uh, this guy, guy, I got a note, some guy backstage, he said, oh, can I come backstage? I have something for you. I was like, okay. He comes and he, bring, and he gives me back this guitar, like, you know, 30 years later. And, and it, it was so, it had mellowed out, the wood had gotten so dark that I just said, I said, I don't recognize this. I think you're wrong. He said, don't you? Re and I finally realized it was my old guitar. But anyway, wow. I got it now. After 30 years later, it did, did make it back. <laughs> That's amazing. So yeah, guys, well, they do that sometimes. When you played the high school talent show, uh, did you get that feeling that you had when you went up and saw your dad playing to the room? Did you did that? Oh yeah. By then, I was already getting that feeling because I was playing. I had a little trio. Um, it was flute and uh, two uh, and and cello and. Um, acoustic guitars and we, we all they all they're multi-instrumentalists and we were very um arty wow. and that was when i was about i think 14 or 15 yeah what how were you received um we we got offered a, a thing i uh, but i at that point i didn't like them anymore so i you know i got offered things early on and i just said nah <laughs> I, I was so dumb. <laughs> Maybe I'd be dead though if I had said yes. So <laughs> yeah, who knows? <laughs> Some kind of weird other life that would have happened. <laughs> yeah. What when you put out your first record, uh, Eliza sixty nine? Was that on a label? It was RCA. I got signed to RCA, and the guy that signed me to the label was canned about a month before my record came out, so every project that he had was launched. And so they gave us all the, the, the LPs that they had printed up, and, and, and so I, we just, I don't Sold know. Sold them yourselves? I, I, you know, you didn't do that in those days. I, I can't even remember. I don't really know what they did. I think they tried to put it out on, on my dad. My dad created a label, and they... They tried to put it out, but it, you know nothing happened. <laughs> so, what happened after that? What did you do? I went to New Mexico, and I literally, I just well, I was in New Mexico when I made that record. I made it in Albuquerque, but um, the, then I had kids. In 1969, I got pregnant with Cisco, and 71, I had Delia, and I spent 10 years just touring um, honky tonks around New Mexico. I did not go anywhere except for. The Southwest, and just playing in bars. I, I really, um, I always did original music, but it was all stuff you could dance to. Right. And uh, Christine Albert and I have a whole history around that. She was in my band. Yeah. And as a young teenager, and uh, so we we ha we have a history that's you know that money can't buy. <laughs> yeah, she t she actually talked a, a bit about that when uh, when she was on the show. She was wonderful. She was a great singer and a great friend. Yeah, always. She said yeah. the same thing about you. Like yeah, I, she, I think she credits you for still being alive. <laughs> wow. Yeah. Well, that's so sweet. Well, well, she definitely my 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 beautiful sister, my little sister. Do you do you uh do you still you still see her often? Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Often. yeah yeah yeah. Good. Yeah, we're we're tight. We we actually live both live in South Austin, so we get together when we can. She has she's busier than I am, so I mean she's she's got quite the world in life. Yeah. yeah, yeah, she really does. Um, yeah. So so you you did that stuff in New Mexico. What brought you to Austin then? Um, uh, I my. My ex uh, was managing me. That's, 
really smart idea. The one I knew? <laughs> Revis, Revis, yeah. Yeah, yeah he, um, he, it was his idea. We went down there. I took my full, I took a 10-piece band down to Kerrville. I got the Kerrville Folk Festival, and, and we decided to take my whole band down there. So we went down in a couple of vans and, um, and played Kerrville and played um, Soap Creek Saloon and some other place I can't remember. And uh, Revis just thought this is, it was a great time in Austin. It was just sort of the end of the cosmic cowboy thing, but it was the beginning of Austin really of creating its own identity with me, branching out the identity past the cosmic cowboy thing into just being a music scene. It was a great time here. And, and that's, so um, I kept coming down here. I came down and opened for Ray Wiley Hubbard at the Opera House and um, Opry House, and I and then I I did a few other things down here, and I met Gary P. Nunn, who um, I came and sang on his uh, Austin City Limits show, and it just felt like here's where here's where it's happening. So um, we just pulled out of, of New Mexico and, mo and moved down here in, in uh, uh, what year was it? I don't know. I don't know. Early eighties must have been early eighties. Early eighties. I think right. I met you yeah, in but, like. 82 right, or whatever. Yeah, Pilgrims was 1981, and that's so actually it was 81 that we did Pilgrims. So I must have been down here by uh, early 80s. Right. Yeah. Um. Then you guys, you did that split EP with Hallman. Did he produce that? <laughs> that's 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 where I met you because I was here for the record release of that show at the. Steamboat. I think at that at that point I I decided I was going to be a pop artist. Yes. And. And that, and Mark and I both decided we would be pop stars, and that that was probably the most embarrassing time of my career. Worse than the new age thing, <laughs> the pop thing was just because I could write. Both Mark and I can write pop songs. Yeah, man, we, we know how to do it. I but love those just, songs. So I they're feel, actually good songs. Yeah, great but, songs, and, and they would fly. You know, yeah. if, um, but 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 the whole um, the whole game that went along with it, we we weren't very. We just heard those kinds. Of, it, it, I don't think we were our we, we were not our authentic selves by stepping into the persona. I think as writers we were, but as performers, it, there was there was a lot of of um, posturing and and image imaging you had to do. Oh, yeah, we weren't very good at that. So we we were we were laughable actually. When I look back on it now, I <laughs> I, I laugh it with embarrassment mostly. I mean, I, I have that for myself. I don't laugh at that time of you guys because that, to me, you guys were like these amazing, you know what I mean? Like I saw, I was I was wearing a completely different pair of glasses back then. <laughs> That's so sweet. That's yeah. so sweet. But I guess we all look back at those formative years and just go, oh my God, you know, I, I kissed a lot of frogs before I became myself. Right, you know? right. Yeah. Yeah, but that's the thing that I think is uh I I use you as an example. I use Alejandro, I use Ray Wiley Hubbard like people that are in the class ahead of me in school. You know what I mean? Like mm -hmm. like how did they stay cool and not become you know? Yeah, how, how did they stay cool? How current? do you, how do you stay yeah, how do you and 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 the the one the one through line that all of you have is you have become more genuinely yourselves with each yeah, record and with each. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that is a really good point. I think some artists are, are there, maybe they're already their true selves right when they start out. But, um, I, and I think I, I, for me, I think I've had to go through a, a huge process of, of, uh, finding out who I am as a just as a person, uh, as a human, and that always has re reflected in my music. Um, I think I had a very similar trauma as you did with my mother when I was about the same age as you. I think I told you I, that yeah, all you those did. years yeah, ago. Yeah. Because I um, because when it happened to you, I, that was all I could say to you at the time was you you will you will come through this. Yeah. What I I I don't think I had the kind of healthy people around me that I think you did, but. I, it really, um, I think I created a real persona, and um, and f for you know survival reasons. Yeah, yeah. I I really ha needed to needed to have that mask, and it was very painful to kind of strip it away and find out who I am musically, and also 
you know, jettison some of these really kind of destructive belief systems. And and so the music became this this way that I that I found myself and and the songs were these vehicles where I where I was constantly you know stripping away trying to figure it out and I think if you put my records end to end you would just see us the story of, of a person really trying to find out who they were and 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 who what their what their what the purpose of their life was how that out in music what was how do I have my life have meaning? You know, how do I inject that meaning into my life? I think you would see that that's the, that's what my music tells the story of. It's not in some ways it's very obvious, and for some people it's, it's not particularly cool. You know, it's it's in a way almost what you see is what you get. And um, but it, it's it's what I do, and I've had to really come to terms with that. Like I'm not going to be the hippest person on the block, but I am going to be somebody who's really doing the Hanuman thing. I'm I'm opening up my chest and showing my heart and that's what I do. So and, and I've gotten a lot more I think uh, confident in myself and feel a lot more like I'm there with myself than I used to. Right. Well I definitely got that going through your discography. <laughs> I definitely have over the last yeah. week. Like like with each record you do find like okay. You know what I mean? Like this person yeah. stripping it away and yeah. uh and I'm over the course of like how many is this is this your 25th album? I think um there it, it's debatable whether this is my 21st if you just ca- um call the album do anything with anybody else but if you add projects or other projects I think it would be 24 or 25 yeah. Right. And what the other projects that you did like you did one with Lucy Kaplansky and somebody else? Yeah, the Red Horse project Red and Horse then project. I spent several years working with Ian Matthews and Aunt Van der Veen and living in, uh, touring in Europe with um, more than a song. That was another project, and um, and then you know little projects where I just add something on somebody else's record or put a song on something. But um, so you know, for instance, Red House Red House Records did coll- um, collections of of songs, and I would do something on those. So I would, you know, those. If you count those, you get, there's more. But if it's just me doing me, then um, then it's 21 records. Yeah. Wow, that's pretty amazing. I guess you know, it's just when you get to be old, you you know, when you started young, then you're gonna have a lot of projects have... under your belt. Yeah. 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 Um, well, let's talk a little bit more about this record. Um, okay. Where did you guys record it? We recorded it in Cisco's studio. Um, awesome. uh, he has a studio in South Austin. Yeah, he built a studio out in back of his house. It's very nice. It's really nice. So it's got a really good high ceiling, really good sound. So um, it's, it's a very comfortable place to work. How did you cut the? Did you were you able? To... Oh well, actually, I should say though, this one record Cisco wanted to cut live. Okay. And so cause... we we went, yeah we went over to um, uh, what's the name the. Uh, Bruce Robinson's place. Oh, yeah, um, yeah, yeah. What's the name of that? We should I, give him the credit. I can't it's remember, not, but I think he closed uh, it down. Yes, he. but he sold it to a collective. Right. Oh, and okay. I'm gonna, and the name of it, I'm going to look because I think we should give them the credit. Estuary. Estuary, yeah. Yeah. They have a killer drum sound in there, Johnny. It's like... It's very 60s. Chico um, Jones did the um, engineered it, but they have worked really hard on their drums to get a really authentic 60s uh, yeah. sound in there. And Cisco just just went in there and just went, oh, okay, we're we're gonna record here because it's just such a good sounding room. Right. I was gonna say that there is there's an inherent people all in a room together feeling to the record. It would be pretty shocking to find out that you did it without yeah. everyone being there. So who all yeah. who all was in on the and it's you and Cisco and Chris Marsh? Uh, Chris and Mike Hardwick and, and Buck. I mean some oh, of the, like yeah, everybody was in there. And uh, some of the stuff we ended up redoing because later on we went, you know what, we'd rather have this be um whirly than piano or sure. you know, stuff like that happened. But um they got a good separation of sound. But I mean stuff like um you listen to sooner or later uh-huh. with Mike Hardwick, that is a live that's a live solo that he did on. That's just one take, and it is the most badass solo. And we had not even performed that song out very much. He just, he just, he just. I mean, it was like he just went out there and just. It was such an odd solo and so radical. I just 
they just loved it. And there's there's some moments like that on there where kids is like, wow, that that did happen. And, and that's that's the beauty of life. Yeah. That's the magic. That's the one thing about people being able to record at home and being able to do their own thing that uh, recording seems to be like uh, processing th- something till it's perfect as opposed to capturing magic. God, that's so true. And I have been, because I'm, I really like to play my own, I like to play guitars on the record. So uh, that's hard for me because I, um, I, I'm singing to try and give them a guide vocal at the same right. time. So, uh, so very often, last many records, I've just cut it to click and it's added stuff. But Cisco really, what really wanted to do this, and I was really pleased with my guitar playing on it. I, I felt like I, I nailed it on a lot of songs. I didn't have to go back and redo them, and and uh, so there was, and there was some good synergy. So you know, we, it wasn't perfect, but that, but the. But the good outweighed the bad. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's where the magic is. It's true. You yeah. just gotta let that let that stuff go, and that's where Cisco is his eye on the prize. Yeah, and he mixed it as well. Uh, yes, he yes. did. He did a great he, yeah, job he really mixing. Did. What a great I job! I was so impressed, yeah. and you know, and that he did in his home in his studio. He's got a great feel for mixing, and then. And then we mastered at Mark's, which was the right thing to do. We were very, very happy with Mark's masters. Yeah. How long have you been, you've been, you so since the early <laughs> 80s, you've been working with Mark on, in some way yeah. or another? Yeah. You know, the, the one, Mark is just so supportive. I mean, anybody who works with him knows the deal with Mark, you know, he's just so there for you. And even after all these years of him producing my stuff and me going over to work with Cisco, because I really wanted to work with Cisco, I wanted to give Cisco this this shot to. Yeah. And I and I thought it would be fun for me to try something different. Mark was so supportive of that. Even just well, if I can help, you know. And it's the kind of guy that he, that I can call and just say, "What I'm I need to borrow a mic because I don't know." Blah blah blah. And he'll say, "You should try this," and I've yeah. got one. And that's the kind of person he is. And, and it, he just he's looking at how how to help. And he pulled us out of a big jam on mastering because we had we were going to go with somebody else. And last minute, it was like, man, we didn't trust this other person, and and we had a deadline and. It was like Mark just, he just went out of his way, to, and Andre too, to fit us in and make sure that we got this thing in on time. And yeah. They were just, that's the kind of people they are. Yeah. He's he's so, uh, it's weird because it, it, I put out this record, I can't remember, like 15 years ago or something, I did it, recorded it all myself and played everything myself, and uh, he, he called and told me that was the best record I ever made. <gasps> and like... Just like That's... like the nod from him, and then also what? like, I wish there were more people in in that aspect of the field that weren't. Every time someone went to do something, they're not always happy for the creative leap that the person's that the artist is going to take. Right? Yeah. The producer wanna... just gets his feelings hurt because he's not included in the yeah. thing. But Hallman's like a big enough person and your friend enough to be like, yeah. oh, this is probably what you should do right now. That's what he does. He goes, "Oh, this that sounds like a smart move for you to make." And yeah. then just let me know if I can help. That's exactly right. Who does that? You know, must be a smart true. guy. Yeah. And the the funny <laughs> thing is I I do go I go back to him like he he mixed and mastered my last record and I recorded part of it at the Congress house and stuff. Like yeah, yeah. you'll always come back to him. That at some is point, exactly you know? right, and he will always have the door open. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's you know, that's so cool. He's just a good, good yeah. person like that. Yeah. So, um, in in listening to this this record and reading about it, I want to make sure that I get this right. Uh, this this is this is like you you're you're making a statement. A politically these are politically charged anthems designed to motivate. Mm-hmm. And um, I mean, I follow you on social media, and I've known you for a long time. You are a person that's not scared to speak their mind of what they think, and is not really an establishment person. <laughs> yeah, uh, which you know, that's the same way I turned out to be as well. Like, uh, what do you? This uh, this record has a purpose to you. What what is that purpose? 
I just wanted to put out a record for the election year. I'm not in a, a, re a recording cycle right now. I just finished Secularia, which was a very right. spiritual record. Right. Yeah, yeah. Got a whole other thing that <laughs> yeah. would probably, right now with the virus going on, Secularia is very appropriate for right now because yeah. it's supposed to be more comforting. And but um, but I did know the election was coming, and I thought, boy, you know, this I really. Um, I, I write a lot of political stuff, and I thought, I'm just going to make a record for this election year. So that's why it's called 2020. I mean, it's very topical. Um, I, don't, I don't know if I... I've called it, I'm calling it political anthems because I want people to sing. I, 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 I really wanted to inspire people to sing because I think it's, it's very consoling and, and it helps build... A strength and courage and solidarity when you sing. So I wanted to write songs that people could sing together. Yeah. And so that's a whole other kind of song, you know, when, because I'm very, I can write really complex songs that have, you know, lots of double meanings. And if you spend time with them, they'll have other meanings. And I write all these levels into my songs and, and, and sometimes it can be complex. And, and, but this is all about, Hey, just repeat this chorus line over and over again. And, Keep things simple and and um, and make it so that people just want to sing, you know, at shows and stuff, and want yeah. to, and want to feel that that sense. Of, it, it was, of course, what Pete Seeger was all about, and yeah. uh, it's really in the folk tradition. So I did put a lot of songs on there, but I can't. They're not all anthemic. And in a lot of ways, the other thing I wanted to to um, aff wanted to to offer in this record was an opportunity to really um, process all the emotions that we're going through right now as we, uh, as our country is it, it being usurped and our, de our democratic process is being usurped and we're seeing uh, climate change coming, climate crises coming down the pike. We, we're seeing, you know, we're, 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 we're sensing the ending of everything and um, it's so frightening and, and so sad. I mean, when you, when you, I mean, on fire, the song that you were yeah, singing, yeah, um, yeah. Uh, uh, promises to keep. I wrote that in the yeah. middle of the Australian fires. It was. I was sitting in a hotel room and I was crying. I yeah. was thinking about all those animals and the trees and everything. It was just, I was so sad. And I thought, I, I'm, I want. We need to grieve, and when we need to be okay with grieving. We can't shut down. We, we have to stay sentient because if we, if we, if we don't grieve if we don't allow ourselves to feel how the epic tragedy that's unfolding right now if we don't feel it if we don't process it then we are not going to be able to show up for this as as uh, as worthy human beings you know we we have to stay sentient and um, we owe this to ourselves and we owe it to our children and uh, so the, so I wanted to give us those vehicles for feeling the the rage for feeling the the incredible sadness for feeling this this sense of the fear all those things with the purpose of processing them and getting ourselves back on our feet and uniting and fighting back but we we don't know if we're going to win this battle but we have to fight yeah yeah i mean there's i i get i get overwhelmed because it, there's a certain sense of helplessness to me I that know. like what what can i say yeah. But the fact that you have the courage to say it and put it out and process it in a way—I don't know—I I, I find it. I'm—I'm I'm also terrible at sort of society songs. <laughs> yes. Well, you know, you can't be good at everything. And I, I saw these friends of mine who write these story songs. They just come up with these characters, and they and they have a whole thing happen to them. And I can't do that. I, I mean, my I, everything I do is based on what's right in front of my face, and I write about the thing that I'm feeling or the thing that I see somebody else going through. I love it that people can put themselves. Art should never be monotone. You know. No. I mean. We, we we want everybody to do the thing that they do, and that's that's what fits the bill right now. This just that happens to be the thing that I do, and I'm glad not everybody's doing it. And yeah. besides that, message music is so hard to take. <laughs> I try not to put a message into my music. I try to just channel my feelings because um, writing about society is not nearly as good as writing a story about somebody who is in the throes of, you know, whatever's going on in the world. I mean, I, it's, 
it's much better art for the but, most part. But you managed to personalize it like this Beach Haven song. Now that really came from a letter, a letter from Woody Guthrie to Fred Trump, like in the Trump. What was that Trump Trump Village? Is that what that's called? Uh, it was called um, Beach Haven. Beach Haven, but is that yeah? That, I guess it's that's before real. he built his place in the Bronx or whatever. Yeah, this was in the Bronx, Beach okay. Haven. It was the apartment complex okay, in, okay. The, in the Bronx, yes. And I, I think they called it the Beach Haven, and but it was definitely segregated. And and Woody was lived in Beach Haven. He did, I don't think he realized it was segregated. And then when he started to find it, figure it out, then he started this. He started to campaign against their segregationist policies. And this letter was just one of you know the many things that that he wrote. To uh, it was a kind of an open letter to. Um, to beat the Beach Haven apartments and to Fred Trump to to figure it out, you know, like hey, these people are let's bring them into the whole thing. We'll do all we'll do all these things together, and it'll be awesome. And and uh, so the the uh, uh, Dina McLeod at the Woody Guthrie um, archives. I ran into her on the street at a festival in um, in Fayetteville. Uh, um, Arkansas, and we just ran into each other, and and uh, she said, you know, I've got a, a song that I think would really work for you from this letter, and and I, it was great because I I had been trying to get over to the archives in, in Tulsa, but I was not succeeding, and so she sent it to me, and it was just like I read the last. We can shake hands together and get together and work together and play together, sing together, dance together. You know, all these fight, fight together and yeah, laugh yeah, together, yeah, fight yeah. together. So all these things, and that was what how he closed the letter. That that was, and I was like, oh my god, there's the chorus right there. Yeah. So just started with that and then just kind of worked out. But I took almost everything in that is from the letter, uh, s some kind of form that. The you know uh, rip out the strangling red tape you know and yeah. the um, the poisons you like red red stamped whiskey this hateful fuel that poisons you like red stamped whiskey yeah I mean that was in there so wow. it was like all I had to do was just first I wanted to find a kind of almost a traveling Wilburys kind of groove on it and then uh, and then just come up with a real just you know happy chord progression and and then just let Woody have his way with it yeah. I was very happy. Uh, yeah, that song. That song also is beautiful. And really quickly before I move on, it, it's it, message music is hard to do. But you're a really great songwriter, and I don't. I, I guess I do view you as a message song. I just I've, I have this distinct memory of of one of the very first times that I was like around you in a social setting was like maybe at Bobby Boss's house. And you were talking to someone about the Bob Dylan song Joker Man. And I remember oh, yeah. going home and like just listening to that song like 18 times trying to figure out what it was you were saying. Because you could was, listen to that song 18 oh, yeah. times. I love that yeah, song. I could yeah. do that. And then yeah. the, yeah, it, subsequently that song ended up being like definitely one of my favorite Dylan songs. Yeah. yeah. Oh, that's so cool. Yeah. It's yeah very that's interesting. Deep, powerful. So that's an apocalyptic song. God dang. That, that's yeah. such a powerful song. Well, I'll tell you, I, the thing I tell my students, because I'm now doing a lot of song writing, teaching, and workshops and stuff, is d don't write a message song, write a great song. Yeah, that's, that's what I feel like you have, do. Yeah. You have to have a great melody, and you have to have lyrics that really stand up. You, you know, it's got to be lyrical and musical, make great music. Right. And if, if you've got, if, if a message comes through from that, then that's great, but, but don't start out. With, I'm going to write a message because then it's just blah, blah, blah. You right. should do this and you should do that. And, and it's just a turn off. So, yeah, yeah you want to make great music first. Yeah, definitely. Um, I would be remiss if I didn't tell you how great Jamie Harris and uh, Betty Sue sound on the record. Yeah, aren't they amazing? Yeah, they're amazing. I, doing that uh, Hard Rain's Gonna Fall, I, which I've been wanting to do for years. Great version, too, by the time. way. Thank you so much. It's such a dark song, so powerful. We slowed it down because yeah. we, I really wanted that imagery. It's just, it's, there's so much imagery in there. It's so apocalyptic. Uh, but I, I couldn't, I had, it was like in the middle of the night, I just went, oh, my God. I Jamie, I've got to have Jamie on this song. I, I could just hear her that that tremulous voice and yeah, yeah. the power in it, and, the, and so much heart at all in that voice. And 
So I and we didn't. She, I wasn't there when she when she recorded. I sent it to you know how we do. We send files. Yeah. And that's what came back to me. It was like, oh my God. So she totally nailed it. Yeah. yeah it's beautiful. Yeah. And uh, same with Betty Sue, who yeah. sang on I think like six or seven, eight tracks. Uh, also done without my being there. We had uh, she just kept sending me files all day long. How about this? How about this? How about this? Like, oh my God, that's just. She's so talented, such a great singer. Yeah, so they both are. Uh, Jamie's yeah. a very inspiring artist as well. She's really, like her songs are, are really touching. Oh, so touching. Yeah, yeah. amazing. It's um, the whole thing. She's going to be pretty excited because I know when I first met her, she texted me. When we first exchanged numbers, she texted me and she was like, you did not tell me you sang background on an Eliza Gilkison song. That's right. So I know she's such That's a huge right. fan. Like she was freaking out. She has been so, so, so um, vocal about me uh, in her interviews and stuff. And I have, I'm so grateful because I tell you, when you get to be almost 70, which I will be soon, I you, you start to think, and, and because I, there's so much ageism in not just in our industry, but there's female ageism that you're dealing with. Sure. And you have a tendency to think, God, you know, what, what am I doing? What did I just do? Am I, you know, am I, you know, am, is it okay? Am I okay still? You know, am, am I just, or am I just beside the point? And I think there is, you have to, there's a lot you have to surrender as you get older, but um, to have someone who's so talented, Sing your praises like that. Who's you know, a few generations down. It, it's 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 really means a lot. Yeah. Well, it's it's yeah. it's you know, the, the 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 fucked up thing about show business is that you get way better at art as you get older. That's like, true. You know what I mean? Well, you you just get way better. Like you're talking you about Mike Hardwick. It you know yeah. played that guitar so maybe he couldn't have done that when he was twenty he probably could have but you no. know what I mean maybe he couldn't have you know <laughs> no uh, he would be the first to say no yeah you know? and I mean Te it, technique is you know takes years it's the weirdest thing because they like just in the Beatles like look at how much better Abbey Road is than their very first album just like yeah. as like artists they yeah. became like. Yeah. real full-fledged artists and you know you keep on going down that line and like I was saying people like you Ray Wiley Alejandro people that are are ahead of me in this game I see Age people wise. that are yeah. able to to stay true to themselves and it seems like really the the further you go inward the more powerful you are as an artist and there's so much weird artifice and shit that you deal with as a young person and so much mm -hmm. fronting and all this stuff that you realize, like, mm -hmm. when the person gets like, hey, I don't care. You know what yeah. I mean? Like, it's I'm a very I'm, freeing. <laughs> this, is, this is just me. Dig yeah. it or not. And I feel, I, I feel like, I, yeah, you've been very vocal about that in the social media world and stuff like that, I've noticed. Well, I, I do think one of the other things, too, that's that as we get older, we become less self-oriented, too. So sure. we do, you know, I... I I've had an incredible life, and it's not about me anymore. I'm not suffering. I'm not in a, a, a destructive relationship. I, I've, I've, I've got a very, very sweet life. And so, my the the challenge is to is how do you stay on the edge? You know, when you're you're, you're comfortable. You, you, you know, I'm not rich. I'm not. I don't have a tour bus or anything. But I am comfortable. And I think that that's why you have to keep challenging yourself to keep growing because that's what that's what how your music stays fresh. You have to keep um, challenging yourself to be a better artist, to be a better person, to, right. to whatever challenges your life. Maybe it's as as you're getting older, you're being challenged to just let go and, and yeah. let let, uh, let other people come up and, yeah. and and step aside for them and and make help them help them come up. You know, right. I mean, instead of going, oh fuck, here comes a bunch of young exactly, people really exactly. talented, getting all yeah. the attention. You just go, hey. Hey, what can I do to help you make it? Because I know it's it's tough, and uh, really that that keeps you keeps you um, on on your own edge of self discovery when you when you keep challenging yourself to be a better person. So I think there's a lot of music that keeps coming. Yeah. When you do that. Yeah, it's funny. I have I have a a, a, a friend who who dropped. He's young, younger than me, but he dropped out. He's like, I'm not gonna. I can't do this anymore. And I never blame anyone for it like that. I'm like, I don't blame you, man. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but no, I but either. I was like, I was like, what's up? And he was like, 
it never ends. You're never there. <laughs> and I was like, no, you're not. That's the thing is it's just a journey. And yeah. if you don't appreciate that yeah. part of it, yeah, then you got to get out. Because if you're waiting yeah. for some kind of end game, yeah, you just go. That's, that's right. Yeah, I'll never, I'll never forget when uh, the first time I met Mark Andes, and he was in the middle of just the heart thing was like, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, it was huge, and uh, and 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 there, and he was saying, yeah, you know, we're um, we're bummed that we're still only in the arenas. <laughs> <laughs> it was so funny that they were only playing the t- <laughs> they're only playing to five thousand people. Yeah. Yeah, you know, it was <laughs> everything. Okay, it never really does end, does it, you know? No. Yeah. And yet, man, that guy and that guy and like all kinds of people, like Ian McLaughlin, like people that kept it real, like to me were always have always been yeah. like the beacons of like, okay, just don't want to end up like Rod Stewart. Yeah, well, it's funny. Yeah, cause ex- exactly. Yeah. Mark just wants to make music, you know. Yeah. I mean, that's where he got. He just wants to keep playing music. That's what kind of what it comes down to. Can we kill? Do we get, get to keep playing? That's all. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Is there some way we can just keep playing till we tump over? You know, that would be good. <laughs> I th- well, I mean, if we're lucky, that's that's how it works out. Yes, if we're lucky, that would be that would be really good. There's a lot of things. I notice, like with my voice, you know, it's really, I just, just, I won't do certain things and it really has a lot of hitches and it's get along, you know, but there's also a kind of a, there's also something sort of surrendered in it that in a way I like it better now. It's kind of world worn and okay, I, I've lived, uh, I've lived a life, you know, and it's just showing up in my voice and you just have, there's trade outs for a- aging is, you know, it's not for the faint of heart, but there, there are, there is a, a beauty way, you know, through, through even that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, uh, I know what you're. Yeah, I know what you're. I, I notice it in my voice, but to me, it's like the, the unpleasant high end is gone, and I'm kind of uh, happy about that. <laughs> happy about it. Like in, in Joan Baez, my, my God, her last record, she, she, she said, "I'm not going to do any more records because I can't do the soprano anymore." And right, I right. listened to her, her last record, and I love her alto voice. It's like, oh my God. Keep yeah. singing like that. That's beautiful. Yeah. In a lot of ways, it's more real. And but you know, she uh, she I think she misses having. She just can't go for the notes she went for. But there's trade outs. You know, like God, Chris Christopherson. Uh, about ten years ago, I saw him uh, at a festival we were playing at, and uh, I got to go on before him. And it was at the beautiful witching hour, at, and there was you know a good fifteen twenty thousand people there. And I got to go on right before him, and after, and he then he went on the stage, and he played for an hour and a half by himself, at age eighty something. Yeah, he's not a good guitar player. He can, he's never was a great singer, and you could have heard a pin drop for an, a full hour and forty five minutes. I mean, it was so good. It was yeah. all about just the authenticity of the person. Yeah, or the great songs. Yeah, great songs. Great songs. Um, we've Canadian been, audience too. They're, they're yeah, the best. <laughs> yeah. Um, you, you, uh, we've been. Uh, you, you, are you quarantining? Are you just hanging out? Yeah, at home? we've. Uh, yeah, my husband was exposed, so oh, no. we actually we're about t- t- um, eight days now into. Uh, it was so, so far, it's looking good. Uh, I had a few days where I was like, oh, this is, my throat hurts, you know. Oh, yeah, yeah. But um, um, no temperature, and my husband feels fine. So he was exposed nine days ago. So uh, we just found out yesterday. But we've been, fortunately, we've just been at our house. So, you yeah. know, we're in, the age, we're in the age group. Oops, lost you. Where did you go? Ah! Oh, yeah. It'll Hang come on. back. It, yours it been, will? Yeah. Yours just dropped out, too. But it comes back. I was going to freak out earlier, but I decided to stay cool. Oh. I, I, I'm, I'm all about staying cool, but I think I did it. I think I closed it out. So um, that's all right. I can still hear you. Okay. Um, all right. What are you doing to? Oh, there you are to pass the time. You, You're back. Oh, okay. Yeah. All right. Well, uh, good. What are you? What are you doing? What are you doing during this time? Obviously, you got a record coming out on April 10th. You're- um. What uh, I'm, what am I doing to pass my time? We're, uh, I'm about to do a video for one of the songs, and we're going to do a virtual video. After, all the players are going to selfie their parts, and oh, Cisco's awesome. going to mix it together. That's coming up. Um, that'll probably be out in about a week. We're doing some some pre-release singles, and the song "One More Day." We're going to um, 
but we're going to do a video around that one because it's kind of a sweet message for right now. I think people are, are you know, it's it's just scary times, and, yeah. and so, um, so we'll 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 put that one out, and um, that's my plan right now. Is to, I have I'm doing a bunch of. Uh, I'm doing all the songs solo in my house over the next few days and sending them to various um, outlets, uh, media right. outlets that want they want a video. They they want a sequestered message from me with a song. So I, I'm the next few days, next week, I'm going to be doing a lot of that. Great. Well, I look and I'm working in my garden. I have a vegetable garden. We go for a walk every day. My dog is is in kidney. She's in kidney failure right now. Oh, so I'm that, sorry. But I, you know, I get to be here for for her, and that's actually I would have been going on the road for a month, and if that I was really scared about leaving her, so um, this is, you know, in a way, it's better for me to be here and be be a comfort to her. So that's happening, and and my husband is here. I have. Do you have anybody in your house with you? Uh, my girlfriend's coming in today from Houston. Oh, that's good. I'm, I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna lie. I really enjoy the the solitude. Well, uh, there so are a far. lot of people who do. <laughs> uh, yeah, I I think if you got sick, it would suck. <laughs> yeah, it would totally suck. Yeah. Yeah, but um, that's great that that you enjoy your solitude. That's you know, there's a lot that we get done when we're in in solitude. Yeah, I've been putting out podcasts every day, and and. I was going to do it anyway during South by, so I was like, well, I yeah. might as well just do it. You can do this without seeing people. I can yeah. keep this going. So, yeah. Yeah. That's um, awesome. I don't know exactly when this is going to drop. I'm going to email your people and ask them when that happens. But um, people can get out. There's two singles out now. Uh, Sooner or Later, and what's the other song that's out? I don't think I wrote that um, uh, Oh, Beautiful World of Mine. Beautiful yeah, World of yeah. Mine. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and then I think one more day will probably be out pretty soon, and um, and then we I did a few covers. I don't know I don't know what's coming next. So that goes the three. Well, that's great. Uh, the record is gorgeous, and really like you know, congratulations on such an amazing journey. <laughs> Thank you, know? you so much. Thank you so much. Seriously, John. like this is this is a real it's a real treat to get to do this finally. I'm sorry it's not actually face to face. Me but, too. Um, but but I've really enjoyed talking to you, and um, we should stay in touch. I I Definitely. I care about you. We we say this from time to time. I care about you, I and know. my memories of you are very fond. And you you were you were very very much there in my life. I, you're one of the first people I hugged when when uh, when my mm-hmm. mom passed. I remember you and Revis oh. and Holman were there. I remember that it always too. meant a lot to me. And your words I... and your yeah, just you. Just you being a person that I can look up to and still try to be as cool as is a great, great gift. Well, let's just continue to be there for each other yeah. as we, as the world turns around us. All yeah. right. Love you so much. I love you too. Thank you for doing this. All right. Bye. Bye-bye. True, for I pledge my life to this beautiful world of mine. Well, there it is. It happened. My dear old friend, Eliza Gilkison, how much I love her. She's amazing. What a great conversation. It was great to get there and stare at her on the video screen. We did that a few weeks ago, but I do have to say uh, her new album, 2020, amazing, gorgeous album filled with politically charged anthems designed to motivate something we need right now. 2020. What, what, how did she know this was going to happen? The album's gorgeous, produced by her son, Cisco Ryder, who I've known since he was a kid as well. Uh, she's joined by the great Mike Hardwick, Chris Marsh, Bucca Allen, Warren Hood, Kim Warner. Cisco played drums, and what a great drummer, man. I, I was not joking when I said I was really blown away by his drumming. What an amazing guy. Jamie Harris and, and Betty Sue singing back up there. Amazing. Amazing. I love Eliza Gilkison. Get out there and check out this album. It's absolutely amazing. I want to thank her for doing the show. It was great to finally get to do it after years of trying to get it together. We finally did it. Find her at ElizaGilkison.com. Get 2020. It's like her 25th album. I don't know. Something like that. We tried to figure that out in the, in the podcast, she told me, but I forgot now. Anyway, ElizaGilkison.com. Get out there and find her. I love her. She's amazing. And gang, when you're out there checking out ElizaGilkison.com, don't forget that you can subscribe to this podcast wherever it is that you stream the podcast, be it Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, TuneIn, Overcast, 
Anywhere you find podcasts, you'll get new shows all the time. Right now, I'm dropping three shows a week, baby. During this quarantine, quarantine, doing this quarantine time, doing this quarantine time, I am totally dropping three shows a week, which is a little different than the average pace of two shows a week. Okay, so uh, also, hey, man, if you're enjoying the show, I know that we're all running low on money. I know myself, a lot of us are out of work. But uh, if you do enjoy the show and you're in a position to kick in a little something, there is in the text of this podcast links to my Venmo and PayPal. You are more than welcome to, to, uh, to kick in something if you are so inclined, and I will be very, very grateful for it. Thank you so much for listening to the show. Eliza Gilkison is such an amazing artist. All right? Get out there and check out this, this album, 2020. Once-in-a-lifetime artist, a legend, a legend. I love her. ElizaGilkison.com. Go do it. Have, have a nice day, whatever it is you're doing in your quarantine life. All right? Let's get down. Unfolding of seasons Your mountains all covered with snow And your flowers in spring Like a bird I will sing To the sunset and the hills all aglow And in summer your gardens of plenty And the fruit from your orchard and vine And your bounty in fall Oh, 